Well, hi there. I'm Graham Moore. And wherever you are in the world, as I always say, it's good to be with you. And today it's particularly good to be with my really good friend and uh, longtime uh, colleague, uh, Dan Schwab, who is right now on the other side of the United States, on the West Coast. And here I am on the other side of the world. Dan, how are you? And it's really good to be with you. Well, thanks, Graham. It's wonderful to join you as well. I'm out here in the San Francisco area on a cold and blustery March afternoon and um, happy to see Graham. Too fad, we're so far apart, we have to do it by Zoom. Yeah, the, the wonders of Zoom, how we, how we do these things. Dan, just for people who might be joining us now, I want to give a little bit of background on you and you can fill in some details because I might not get the right ones all the way. Dan has been a certified master for a long time. He's been delivering the Leadership Challenge for many years. Am I okay with many? Yeah. I don't want to make it sound like I'm a fossil or anything, but I got involved with Jim and Barry in the Leadership Challenge in the 1980s as their outdoor challenge course guide. So while they were presenting early versions of their work to groups of executives in a classroom, we would take breaks from time to time and take the group outside and do outdoor experiential events that backed up or uh, embodied the practices of leadership. It was a tremendous uh, introduction to the world of learning and development for me and uh, to deepen my practice of human development. And I guess you'd say I haven't looked back. Well, I know that you've been working in this field for a long time and I certainly have learned so much from you in the years that we have been friends and colleagues mm -hmm. and every time we have a conversation I, I'm pretty sure that I learn and I know that I'm going to learn today in this conversation. I thought that today we might talk about the all-important uh, thing that doesn't always happen in organisations and this is succession planning. Now, I'm pretty sure that over the years that you've been helping others and coaching leaders as well, that this is something that you would have had experience with and even identified times when organizations should have had it in place but haven't. Oh, that's probably the common situation, uh, Graham. And think about it like this. And we enter our careers, we don't necessarily think about the end of our careers. We think about the ascendancy, how I start at some entry level and build skill and experience and expertise going forward to reach some uh, high level in an organization or to fulfill one's professional aspirations. And oftentimes we don't, even though we know it, we don't recognize that that's going to be completed at some point and we're going to drop off the other side. And yet to begin with the end in mind means thinking about not just how do I grow my skills and reach the maximum audience the maximum power of what I have to offer. But what happens on the other side of that as um, I relinquish those positions and, you know, head towards other phases of life? Uh, hopefully we're not entirely defined by our careers and we can see ourselves as elders doing something else. Um, and I think that happens to us on an individual level, but it certainly happens on the organizational level as well. We get uh, we grow people to uh, inhabit senior positions and to function at a high level. But within that uh, high degree of competence, there are also the seeds of needing to hand it to someone else to recognize that succession, um, like a lot of things, it is inevitable. There will come a time when we can say, all right, I've done that. Uh, or the organization can say, you know, we, uh, we'd like to see you exit within the next couple of years or something. Let's help you do that in a way that's good for everybody. Wouldn't that be a great world if we did that? Absolutely. And, you know, when you're saying this, it, it reminds me of something that I said on a, on a webinar a few years ago now, when I said that there are, I used to say that there are three, two things in life that are certain. One of them is death and the other one is taxes. But there is a third thing that is certain. And What's that, that? You will leave the organisation that you're with. You may leave yeah. sooner rather than later. You may leave yeah. it. As a choice, you may leave it because it's not your choice, or it may be at a time when it's later on in your career and you're leaving to move into retirement. It may be at a time when you are leaving to join another organisation. So mm -hmm. uh, those four, I think, 
points that I've just mentioned, surely the leader who is already developing other leaders, as we say, leaders develop leaders, surely the leader should be aware of, <laughs> do we need to encourage them to be aware of those other points in, that could arise that they could be leaving for in sometimes uh, ways that they didn't expect or they could be moving on to greener pastures and other organisations. But there's still going to be a departure from the organisation. And Absolutely. It's oh. a certainty, like you say. So let us not ignore certainty. Instead, let's plan for it. Let's build it into the equation. When I take this job uh, and I have my job description and my assignment, what I'm meant to accomplish and what I hope to accomplish, both for the organisation and for myself, is to recognise there will come a time. There's a beginning, middle, and end of everything. So let's just think about that from the beginning. It seems much healthier to me. Absolutely. So what are some of the resistances that, or resistance points that you've identified in terms of succession mm -hmm. planning? Is this something that falls within the the, the area of the HR or the, the, the L&D department, or is it the individual? Where is it most a, a problem, do you think? Well, I think it, it needs to be expressed in all of those places, but let's take the individual first. You know, we, we um, all of us like to be in control and don't like to give up authority or power. I mean, that seems to be pretty universal for humans. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing necessarily, but we have to recognize that you won't always be in control. In fact, if you really look at it, you're probably not in control, control with a capital C now, rather it's more like riding a wave. And you can direct some parts of it, but we are always buoyed up by a much larger ocean, if you will. And I think it's really incumbent upon us to help, especially high-performing individuals, recognize there will come a time when you need to relinquish that sense of control or that sense of power, whether you feel it's power to get things done, or maybe if you're of the mindset of it's power over other people, is to recognize that at some point you're going to put that down. But that's a good thing. You know, that's a release, that's a freedom, that's a moving on that we should build into every uh, person's expectation about their career and about their particular job. Can I just go take a little tiny window, if you like, and, and extend it okay. out? So here's, here's what I say, that as a leader, when you go on leave, I want you to enjoy the leave that you are having from the organisation. If it's four, let's just say it's four weeks. Yeah, just pick a pick a figure, an arbitrary time. That like a good yeah, yeah. But I don't want you as the leader to be concerned about what might or might not be happening in your absence. I don't want you to be feeling that you need to be checking the emails or calling the office or making sure that things are being done. Because if you as a leader are doing a fantastic mm -hmm. job, then when you go away on leave, everybody will say have a great holiday and a great time. And whilst you are away, because of what you have put in place as a leader along the way, it's going to run smoothly. Would you agree? Right. Uh, well, one would hope, right? That's the, that's the most resilient mindset to yeah. have, which is my job as a leader is not just to get things done. Of course, I'm responsible for whatever our no. uh, scope is, but rather my job really is to empower the people around me to get all of those things done in such a way that they can do it without me in fact, they'll probably do it better than me if I if I'm uh, fulfilling that role. Yeah. So therefore, in that window or that period where I'm away or that time, and I've empowered people and developed a culture where people are engaged and are taking initiative and all of those wonderful things that we want leaders to to be able to create. It's kind of like, in in a sense, a you know, do that several times, and then you can get ready to say, "This is it. I'm going off into the sunset, or I'm going off to play that long golf course, or whatever." So that it's mm -hmm. kind of, in a sense, a mindset, perhaps, that if that leader develops uh, along the way, that he can go or she can go away and do what they need to do for their break and come back refreshed, knowing that everything is being running at least as smoothly and sometimes perhaps even better, then when mm -hmm. it comes to the time that they're moving on, that there should be no hiccups, no difficulties. It's the same sort of thing, only it's going to be for a longer term that applies. Yeah, and I, I think that's the mindset to approach uh, our job as leaders with. You know, if we 
have trouble letting go for two weeks, which is how much vacation that people get in our, our country, Graham, <laughs> if we're lucky. Uh, if you can't let go for two weeks, what's it going to be like when the day comes for you to graduate from that job altogether? It's going to be really hard, right? And one of the most poignant things I see as a coach are uh, uh, primarily men at the end of their formal career, really not having built another life beyond that or built the life they want beyond that as an emeritus worker, you know, as a retired person, as an elder, as a citizen of their community. Because if we define ourselves just as the jobs we do, how tragic that is. Yeah. We are much larger than that. And no matter what jobs we have, those are all very important, yet they are only one part of the life that we live. So, so as, from what you're saying, uh, I, maybe it's even a significant part of adopting an approach to succession planning is accepting that it's going to happen. You're going to be leaving. And, yeah. that, and, and when you accept that, and you plan accordingly, it's going to be better for you and also better for what you leave behind. That, that, it seems uh, sort of obvious on its face, what, what you just said. And yet we don't practice that. And the same, you know, you asked, how does this play out within an organization? And I would say it's probably the role of senior leadership, specifically the HR function, to help people recognize there's a cycle to their careers. There's a beginning, a middle, a high performance peak, and then it's probably going to start to tail off. And to help people understand that just the moment when you pass the peak, you want to be looking to what's next for you. Or in fact, maybe before that even, so you build the steps toward whatever your next career aspiration might be. In an organization, if there is a gap in leadership, if, if essentially the organization um, hits a... Uh, pause because people aren't ready to take it to the next stage, that's going to um, create a slowdown in the organization's progress. It would seem to me, we want to make that handoff smooth. Okay. I think we like sports metaphors. Think about running a relay race. The uh, person number one's carrying the baton and they come around the track and person number two has already started off when they get the baton. They're not starting from a dead stop. That would be, inefficient it wouldn't win you the race and maybe there's some uh, parallel here <laughs> so the person t who's t picking up the bat and it's not going to be saying what do i do now <laughs> yeah which direction do i run direction oh, hopefully I have to run <laughs> right? yeah <laughs> i mean that that's just it's common sense in a way and yeah. yet we i think probably based uh because of the pace of business and just the crush of getting everything done. We don't live this way as much as we might. And that would be, I think, a very important intervention from a senior leader to just say, not just about me, but about all of us here. We have to prepare the person who's starting to run now to take the baton from us and hand it off before we're too tired. Yeah. yeah. Before we slow down. We should we should make these transitions when we're at our peak. Yeah, and you know when you're using the baton changing metaphor, in realize that is always or always should be very efficient. One would hope. Passing. Which means you have to plan for it. Yeah. yeah, you have to work on it. You can't expect that person to take over your role with two weeks' notice or a month's notice. No, more like a year or two, maybe. I don't know. It depends on the job, I suppose. But we should all know that we're we're looking for opportunities to accelerate and to excel in what we do. And that means feeling like the opportunities are there for us to do that and that the people above us who are older, more experienced, whatever, are not just an obstacle. Uh, many people, when they come to me as, uh, as their coach and say, well, I'm trying to institute change in our organization. And there's these this guy, it's usually a guy above me who just won't get out of the way. What do I do with that? And I say, well, you really have two choices. You can outlast them, uh, you can outmaneuver them, or you can leave and go someplace else. Yeah, yeah. And the, the point being that if you're the one who is the quote obstacle, and I've been there, I know what that's like to feel like, oh, I'm the one who needs to change here, is to look around and recognize the effect of that on other people. Yeah. Because it's going to be there and it's probably going to... Uh, well, 
be difficult for people to see you as an obstacle. So let's let's focus for a moment, or maybe more, on the person who is carrying the the baton. And mm-hmm. what your experience? What are the resistance points? What are the what 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 sort of resistance do you experience in having them recognize? Yep, the time is coming in twelve months or eighteen months, or rather than in three weeks that I'm leaving. Mm-hmm. Well, it gets obviously it gets delicate because you can't say, well, in 12 months, you're going to be the senior director or something. You know, uh, I think it's development for the people who are coming up needs to be more broad based than that is to ask them in order for you to fulfill your career desires where you'd like to be in a year, five years, 10 years, what have you. What do you need to be adding to your skill set and to your portfolio? And let's help you get that so that when opportunities arise, you are ready. Isn't that the definition of luck is opportunity meeting preparation? Yep. Um, uh, but there's no guarantee in that in probably in most circumstances, because going for those top jobs will probably be competitive uh, as it well. It should be. It might be someone from outside the organization turns out to have the best shot at moving the organization forward rather than someone that was homegrown. But if we've committed to employee development, to human development, uh, that will the talents that, and skills that people develop will never go to waste because they'll always find another avenue and it might, might be in your organization or not. And you know, I think if you've cultivated someone uh, who you see as an up and comer that you would like to replace you or someone else in the organization, and you've invested a lot in them, and yet then they choose to leave and go somewhere else, you should still be really happy. Yeah, yeah, about sure. that. Sure. You help that person build their own success. Uh, hopefully that doesn't take anything away from you. Sure. But, okay, the other approach is the person who is at some stage going to be leaving, uh, the senior person, how much of the responsibility for succession planning do you believe should be with that person? Oh, I don't think they should try to do that on their own. I mean, these are organizational decisions. I think there, there are several components of this. First, that person, that senior person, hopefully any of us uh, will do better if they cultivate a vision for themselves. Like, where would I like to see myself at some point down the road? Not just what what do I want to see myself doing, but what kind of person do I want to be? And am I developing into that person? How do I accelerate that or, or cultivate that? That's an individual responsibility yeah. where I think a, a smart HR advisor or other senior person or an executive coach can help that person ask good questions for themselves of where do you want to be now that your kids are out of college and your mortgage is paid off or whatever. I mean, we come up with a lot of scenarios of imagine yourself five years from now, where doing what, who are you, but it's the organizational uh, imperative to guide those conversations for sure, to make it clear that we want to have those. And there might be a role for a mentor within the organization, someone who's, higher up or been there longer than you to help you ask those questions. Um, I think in a well-run system, uh, someone in the HR department, the HR director or the person who might be in charge of succession would be cultivating people's self-awareness about where they want to be so that we can help them advance, but also so we can recognize if if and when this person leaves, this is the kind of hole we're going to leave. Here's who are the potential candidates. And I know there are even software systems that track people's uh, ascendancy, I guess, for lack of a development, for lack of a better word, in this way, in a big enough organization that hopefully you'd have those resources and you pay attention to them. Because isn't the, uh, it's, it's that whole Wayne Gretzky thing about how does he succeed? It's not going to where the puck is, but where it will be, right? Hockey player. Um, it's like that. And of course, that's an easy thing to say, but to institutionalize it, I think that um, takes a lot of fortitude, partly in, because people's egos are involved in this. You want me, now that I'm in a senior position, you want me to think about leaving? I just got here. I'm in, I, you know, I don't want to give this up. We have to help people get over that. So if I'm the CHRO, just imagine for a moment, I'm the CHRO. Okay. You'd be a good one. <laughs> uh, not really. Uh, so... Here's a question that as a CHRO that I we're talking about vision, which is really important as we know, 
But how about this for a, as a question to someone who is coming within a couple of years, shall we say, of retiring from the organisation? And he knows that and I know that because I'm the CHO mm -hmm. and he knows that. So as a question, how would this be if I know he's going to be leaving or coming up to it in the, at about two years, let's say two years' time? Yeah. Would okay. I say, how would this question be? So tell me your vision for the next five years. Because two of them will be here and three of them somewhere yeah. else. Yeah. yeah, that's a good way to blend that. Yeah, because that might be a personal vision. Well, I would start with that. Sure. You know, where are you going to be with your family? Yeah. Um, with your soul in five years? And how does work fit into that? Rather, because mostly we think about it the other way. We think of all about career stuff, but not about, well, what kind of human beings are we? But you know, the question that I ask people, and I actually had this, uh, this is a real life example of a person who was in one of my leadership classes. It was close to the end of his career. He worked in a public agency. He had created a lot of the regulatory framework that they worked under as a really accomplished guy. But he had two years to go and uh, he wasn't doing anything. He was basically watching the clock, tick, tick, tick. He was probably crossing off the days on his calendar so he could retire and be with his grandkids. And someone else in the organization came to me and said, this guy is an obstacle he's you know he's got the position he's got the chair he's getting the salary but he's you know he's way past his poll date so to speak so i i got him on the phone when we were debriefing his leadership assessment and i just asked him one question which was how do you want to feel on your last day here wow that got him thinking because yeah. he could have just kind of disappeared and people would say what what happened to bob he used to be here yeah you know kind of goes out uh, and I said, you got him thinking about it, about, well, what would that last day feel like if he took those last that last year or two and turned it into the most productive time of his career? You know, did all the mentoring he could handed off, you know, educated people, cleared out all those boxes of papers under his desk, just took it and made it his, uh, you know, his final number, I guess you'd say. Yeah. Uh, that was really fascinating because I think it triggered in him the sense of his professional uh, pride yes. in, that had gotten tarnished and tired from just doing the same old thing. Yes, yes, yes. Work Look, I have had similar experience. And when I have people in organizations say, oh, Bob or whoever, which pick a name, he's 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 about to retire. He's retiring in 18 months and he, we can't motivate him. We can't get him to do anything. He just turns up and takes his salary. And I say, why don't you talk to him about the experience that he has and what he can leave behind? Yeah. What, what legacy exactly. can leave? Make it, help him feel good about that. You know, it, it, we invest more time in work. I mean, it's insane. how when, when you look back on your career, how many hours of work and striving and headaches and being awake in the middle of the night and worried about the, all of that, to just have it sort of fade away at yeah. the end. You'd want the last day to be the best day. Yeah. Then you can go and play golf. But yeah, um, or whatever. Yeah. Whatever. Then, whatever you find purpose in, because that's the part of here that we haven't really mentioned much is purpose in all of this. What's your mission? Because you have a mission at work. It is to do whatever the company's uh fulfill the company's mission. But what's your personal mission? Sure. And, and don't ask that question. And if you can help this person who's become stale because they're retiring in three years after 37 years of service, if you can help them find purpose in them helping others, then that leaves a legacy. And they have I, it's, a, it's about the purpose that they have for the next 18 months or whatever it is. And then when they check out in that in that last day, as you said, think about what you're going to be feeling on the last day. And when you check out in the last day, you think, wow, the last 18 months I've shared so much with the people who are yeah. here behind. Yeah. So that sense of satisfaction about graduation. Yeah. Because, you know, we humans like to be in control of things. We like predictability. We like to know what the road looks like. But that's an illusion. We, we don't know what the road looks like. You know, there's so many uncertainties in our life and you don't have to think very hard to come up with an example of somebody who thought they had it all figured out and then something happened. Uh, maybe it's happened to you. It has happened to me. To, to understand that exploration and uncertainty are very, very powerful. 
uh, mythologically in our lives and how we think about ourselves is to recognize that at age 65 or whatever age, if you're done with your career, to step into an unknown place of saying, well, it looks like I still have my health, you know, financially I'm okay and I've got this family situation and I'm going to, I'm going to find out entirely new things about myself. Mm -hmm. I'm going to engage that wonderful capacity we have for imagination and um, curiosity because those are the things that take us forward. Um, but oftentimes those sense, those uh, faculties are dulled by the kind of work that we do and just the grind, right? The wear and tear. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I, I when we're coming to the end of our time, but I really think just to kind of bring this around to a little bit of a summary, I, I think that, we could say that the, there are people in the organisation who should be looking after the succession planning process. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, One I would hope. Yeah, yeah. But I would also think that we ne really need to engage the person who is going at some point to be leaving and to be engaging them in a purpose for what they are going to be doing in the next whatever the period mm -hmm. of time is to improve their mm -hmm to improve their output and the legacy that they can leave. So it's it's both of those. It's the how it's being managed and set up and delivered by the HR department or whoever, but it's action with the individual who's going to be leaving about what he's going to leave behind and what, what does he want in terms of his purpose in the time before he leaves. Is it simply about hitting his sales numbers? Because when he leaves... We'll all, we'll all just say, well, he hit his sales numbers and got a great result this year, but... Yeah, I can't remember what he looked like. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'll take it one step further. I think you're, you're really right that that's the way we need to present this is both personal and organizational. But I take it one step further. This is how we should onboard people. Yeah. When somebody comes to the organization, we can say, okay, you've gotten, you've jumped through all the hoops. You're here now. Here's your job. Here's your, what we hired you to do, and it's based on, on your skills and your background. And, uh, you know, we're clear you can do this job. And along the way, we're going to help you build your career skills in the direction that you want to take it. And hopefully that will be here, but it's no guarantee it will be here. However, we want you to be already thinking about preparing for your next career or your next job. And we're going to bring that up from time to time to help you think that way. Because, you know, when we talk about loyalty to organizations, it isn't just, did they actually fund my 401k or whatever when we're out of there? It's also, what did that job experience, what did that work experience give me personally that I took forward? And that enthusiasm or encouragement to grow the whole time I'm here, assuming we can do that, uh, we have some resources for that. Well, that person's going to look back pretty uh, kindly upon the experience versus, well, yeah, they hired me and I had my little cubicle and I had my little assignment, but they never paid attention to me as a person or to what future I'd like to create for myself. That was entirely offline. Um, it's easy to see where the where loyalty was more likely to fall there. Wouldn't it be wonderful if every HR department did exactly that? Wouldn't it be wonderful? It had changed the, the we'll start a revolution. It would change. It would absolutely be a revolution. Revolution, and it would change right from the start the level of engagement that that each individual is going to have. And but of course, having had that conversation with them, they've got to deliver on it as well. Um, but at least they have the conversation. Let me just yeah. Let me just mention briefly the the only conversation that I recall on when I started my very first job about three hundred years ago. And uh, in the HR department, the only the only memory I have of what the HR department said to me on that day was, what, what age do you want to retire, 60 or 65? I, I remember thinking this, you were like, this is like a prison. You were like 25 at the time or something? I was 18. This is like a prison. Oh, okay. uh, this, was, this was my God. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember. <laughs> you were probably aghast to think, oh, oh my God, I'm going to spend 42 years exactly. here or anywhere. Exactly. Yeah. But, I mean, of course, it's a lot of how we frame the whole journey of our lives. Is yeah. it about just work or what adventure am I on as a person? Yeah, and yeah. How does work fulfill that? Because if we take that approach, well, then we're going to bring out the best in people versus it being the opposite but it, it's it's easy to understand i think for for both of us for, for all of us how hard it is to institutionalize things like this it starts with a change in mindset 
but that's what leaders do. Leaders' job is to challenge the way things are done yeah. and to find and introduce new ideas or just ask good questions like, what if we did this or why do we do it that way to get us all thinking about it? Because there's always a better way to do things. Yes. Yes. There's always room for improvement. Um, um, and start thinking about, well, what is going to lead to high engagement amongst people coming into the workforce now? Their expectations are going to be really different. Yeah. Uh, we need to know and cultivate those things because they're they're moving. I mean, we're all connected now. Uh, information is no longer power. No. Because no. everybody. Got it. And you and I are in the area of... Uh developing people developing helping people believe in what they're doing and creating better leaders in this world dan as always i'm most grateful for the time and the wisdom and your experience that you have shared with me today i am most grateful and i know the people listening to this will learn a lot from you as well so thank you so much dan that's a fun for me too and uh good luck to all of us thank you thanks dan